I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Triad Today. Coming up later on, our infamous roundtable gets together. We'll see what they have to say about a wide range of topics. So stay tuned for the fireworks at the end of the program. But between now and then, some great guests uh, coming your way. We'll learn about a leadership class that's making a big difference in the community. And speaking of that, a big difference being made by some good folks at Goodwill on their ability services training. That and much, much more coming your way over the half hour. But first, we start out with somebody that understands television because she has been in television. And I'm so glad she could be a first-time guest with us. Next to me, the very lovely Nicole Duker. And Nicole is Director of Corporate Communications for IFB Solutions Industries for the Blind. And you used to see her on WXII-TV. And now we see you here. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to see you. Now, everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, I watched you. I watched you there on, on, on uh, XII. But you've made the adjustment now to working for Industries for the Blind, IFB Solutions. Tell us just a little bit, we'll get into some other things, but tell us a little bit about what the organization does. IFB Solutions is a local nonprofit. We're based in Winston-Salem. We have manufacturing facilities in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Asheville, North Carolina as well. We've got nearly a thousand employees. A large portion of them are blind or visually impaired, and it's just an amazing place. We're making things like tactical gear for the military eyeglasses for veterans at VA hospitals, mattresses, office supplies for our base supply centers on military bases. It's just a gem. It's such an inspirational place. You know, not only are we doing that, but we do so much for the community. We have a little red schoolhouse right on campus for kids, for after school programs. And that's something. Yeah, we've got C camps, student enrichment experience camps for kids who are blind and visually impaired. They do things like rock climbing, whitewater rafting, cooking dinner for their wow. families. It's amazing. We have a community low vision center where people who are have low vision can come in and get magnifiers or special equipment, assistive technology, watches that talk to you. It's a really good place for those folks who have independent lives. Yeah, and I, you know, the thing is, uh, I think folks at home should know this because when they would watch you on, on Channel 12, mm -hmm. WXII, they might not have known that you really had a close association with IFB Solutions. I did. You know, I think I started telling stories through journalism uh, about a decade ago at IFB Solutions. I, I met a girl who was born at one pound. They didn't think she would live to see tomorrow. She did. Today she's 25 and thriving and employing at, employed at IFB. But she kind of opened the door to me for IFB. And so when I started telling the stories, they invited me to be on the board of directors, the PR committee. And so, you know, when this job opened up, I had to take it. I mean, I've talked to you about my husband's career in NASCAR and he was busy, I was busy, we had a kid at home and this was just the perfect Dream opportunity. Job. Yeah, and for me personally, my career and my family, and WXII was so supportive, I can't thank them enough. And you're such a great cheerleader for the cause for, for what's going on at IFB too. It's just a perfect fit. Before time gets away from us, I, I just want to mention something serious though, and you alluded to it earlier, mm -hmm. that uh, most of the folks are, are, do not have sight that work there. And a lot of times people will have this perception, well, uh, you can't be a good employee if you're blind. Right. And, but the statistics are sort of staggering, aren't they? It's amazing. I mean, 70% of working age adults who are blind or visually impaired are unemployed. That's an unemployment rate that's amazing. And you know, it's part of our mission to change that. We want to employ these folks. We're bringing them in from all over the world. You know, our recruitment is interesting and it's different because you, you know, you want to recruit people who are sighted and blind or visually impaired. And you're training. We train them. We'll devote six to eight weeks. You get the, a job of choice. You want you to move up in the company. Upward mobility is a big thing. You might start in a sewing machine, end up in a corner office. Um, and that's something we want. We want that path to success for anybody who's blind or visually impaired. So we encourage those who might know somebody who needs that work, come see us because we're doing great things. That's great. Now on September 15th, there's a big event coming up. You emailed me, something big's coming yes. up. What is that? You got an invite, right? <laughs> <laughs> you better come. It's our gala. It's September 15th at the Benton Convention Center. And um, Amazing Hidden Stories is the theme. And it's because when people come for a tour at IFB, they say, gosh, this is such a hidden gem. I didn't even know you were here. We don't want to be hidden anymore. So come learn about us, but mostly have a good time. Bring some friends. We've got a great band. Envision's going to be there, a 12-piece band. It's going to be a good time. It's our biggest fundraiser. That's great. I want to give for the viewing audience and the radio audience on WSJS this. IFBSolutions.org is the website. I really want you to visit that. And since Nicole mentioned the Community Low Vision uh, Center, that's on Facebook. and get more information about that. So again, IFBSolutions.org. Please do that. And Nicole, don't be a stranger, will you? I won't. I'll see you at the gala. Buy tickets. Come enjoy. Have a good time. <laughs> All right. Nicole Duker. We'll be right back after this. On uh, Try Today, and uh, so glad we could uh, get this lovely lady with us to talk to us about a very serious topic. And let's meet her right now. Next to me, my good friend Holly Solomon, who's Director of Communications 
for Cross North School and Children's Home. And uh, welcome to try it today. Thanks. It's great to be here. We usually have you behind the scenes That's and right. uh, bringing guests to us and, and sort of herding people in here. But we wanted to grab you and put you up on the set and ask you a few questions. One of the things is, just in case people have missed some of the other segments, just uh, talk a little bit about the mission of Cross Nora, who you serve and, and what you provide. Sure. So our mission really is just to provide a sanctuary for children and families where they can find hope and healing. Uh, we work with children that are in foster care. We provide residential group living on our campuses. We also do community-based foster care and adoptions, and then some clinical services for outpatient and school-based therapy. That's something you and I've never talked about until the other day. We really haven't talked about it yet. I mean, you emailed me something, and you said that, that Cross Noor is working to connect with, work with and connect with yes. faith, the faith-based community. What did yes. you mean by that? So Cross Noor is a faith-based organization. We have been for the more than 100 years that we've been in existence. And so we're always looking for those kinds of connections. So for instance, all of our children um, that live on campus in our cottages attend a community church. And so that's a way for them to get involved in their community, okay, I didn't know that. Uh, get to know people outside of our organization. Uh, and to, to have that support for their own spiritual development, whatever that might look like for them. Um, but we also have a lot of church groups that will come in and do volunteer f work for us. Yeah, I was getting ready to say, what can, if, if I'm the a minister of a local church or a deacon or somebody that's, you know, throughout the triad, really, anybody that's, that's sure. watching or listening, uh, what ways can they support? You mentioned volunteerism. Give me some examples of things that, that I can do or the parishioners can do from various churches. So we've had volunteer groups come in and maybe uh, sponsor an event for our children, you know, a cookout or something like that. Uh, sometimes we've had uh, churches that wanted to do something special for our staff. Uh, churches sometimes will take up special collections for us or will do drives for, uh, you know, bed linens or toiletries or something like that. Because you can always need. use help. You can Absolutely. use materials. You can use donations Absolutely. of that. Because people need to remember, I mean, we have kids living there on campus. It's a beautiful campus. Yes. If you go by Renolda Road and, and, and see it, it's a beautiful yes. rustic looking campus with animals. You still have the animals there, the, the farm yes. aspect. Now, I heard that you, the, uh, the Cross Norris recently uh, began doing a, a sort of training, uh, have a training arm to the mission. Yes, we have opened just this year kind of a new training arm called the Center for Trauma Resilient Communities. Okay. And so we're offering training in what does it mean to be trauma informed and how can you use that information then to build trauma resiliency. And we offer that training to public and private uh, organizations. We've done training in schools, uh, we've done training for hospitals, medical uh, practices, other organizations similar to Cross Noor. Uh, and we've also done some training in churches. So a colleague of mine and I recently did some training within the United Methodist Church where we had the opportunity to speak to nearly a thousand pastors and talk to them about uh, trauma-informed care and, and sort of how to recognize the symptoms and signs of trauma. And, and we just have a few seconds left, mm -hmm. but you, I don't want you to talk over my head. You said trauma-informed. I want to make sure we understand what you mean by that. Give me a, a quick example. So all of us have trauma, but particularly our children who are in foster care, they have experienced some very difficult things even in their very short lives. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of things then affect how we then respond, how we behave, how we sort of process the world around us. Sure. And so when we come at that from a trauma-informed approach, then we can better understand what's happening with someone um, and what has happened to them and how we can respond appropriately. I don't think that's great. I yeah. think it's great. That's and awesome. up on screen, I want people to check this out, www.crossnor.org. And for our radio listening audience again, crossnor.org is the website. Uh, so many fine things you're doing, great things you're doing for the community and helping the kids, and I really salute what you and Brett and everybody are doing. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Ollie Solomon. We'll be right back after this. Now on uh, Try Today, so glad you could stay with us. Uh, we have uh, two very lovely ladies with us right now to talk about something very important, and that's putting people to work, getting them trained. Next to me, let me introduce them to you right now. Monique Wagner is coordinator of Ability Services for Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. And next to her, her partner in crime, the lovely Carol Nunez de Soleil, job coach and employment specialist by way of New York City and Florida. And we welcome uh, both you ladies to be here today. Uh, Monique, let me start with you and uh, tell me something about what Ability Services program is all about in case people don't know about it. Okay. 
Ability Services Program is a program that is designed to help people with physical and mental disabilities find employment. We serve a variety of clients, some that don't have a high school diploma, all the way up to some that have a master's degree. Got to be a tough barrier. I mean, we all have barriers and, and obstacles to overcome, but especially if you have a physical or mental disability and you're looking for, for work, that's added stress, right? It is. It is. But we help guide them through that process. And the requirement then goes back to your answer, which is you, you, it doesn't matter whether you've got a GED or a master's or a PhD, you, you must have a... A, a documented disability. A documented disability. That would come from a doctor, a physician, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, all right, once you're in the program, we'll tell how we can get in the program in a minute. What kind of services does the program provide? Give me a couple examples. I'll give you a couple examples. So we have a wonderful computer lab where we do individualized um, assistance, helping them with their job search, such as online applications. And learning the computer, too. Yes. They sort of get we exposed to that. We do have some that do need that extra assistance. We also provide case management one-on-one -on -one to help provide them with assistance with their career counseling, helping them find the right direction as far as a job go. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Carol, what is your role as job coach and employment specialist? My role here is to help support the participant in securing employment, helping them through the job process, especially during interviewing and the onboarding process as well, but also um, to establish a good business relationship with employers to help them match uh, their needs with our participants. Oh, okay, so, so in other words, if I'm an employer and I need uh, some, some people to do some work for me, then if I touch base with you, you're going to sort of guide them from one end and guide me from another and sort of maybe say yes. that there's some opportunities out yes, there. Yes, I look at both of your interests and what you're looking for as an employer and also with my participant, what they want also as a job and see if they are a great match, then guide them both to become a excellent outcome there. Now you, have, you hold workshops. Now is it once mm -hmm. a week, twice a week? What's in these workshops and when are they? We hold uh, twice a week's workshops. Uh, Tuesdays um, from 3 o'clock to 4.30 and Wednesdays from 9.30 to 10.30. Right. And in these workshops you really learn how to do great interviewing, acquire those skills. Uh, we do resume workshop as well, uh, whether it's an old resume or a new one you're going to create. We have reference sheet, but most importantly also, we also uh, teach the business uh, letter writing in which there oh, you can, good. yeah, you can learn there how to do a thank you letter, cover letter, and most importantly, a letter of accommodation in case you need to present one to your employer. Letter writing is sort of a lost art, isn't it? And I'm, yes, gl it I'm is. glad you're doing that. Monique, is it tough to get uh, registered or enrolled in ability services? No, it is a simple process. We have info sessions every Monday at 10 o'clock, so if you come to our main location, and let the receptionist know that you're here for our orientation. We will come out. And you're saying in Winston-Salem. That in will Winston be the main Salem. location. You can just yes. walk into that on, on University Mondays. Parkway. Well, yep. Find out more information though, on screen, and for our radio audience, I'll repeat it. It's uh, goodwillnwnc.org is the website, goodwillnwnc.org, and 724-3625. To Monique and Carol, thanks for all you do for the community. I appreciate it, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be right back after that. Back now on uh, Try It Today, I always like it when this special guest can drop by and see us. And this time our special guest brought a special guest with her. We're going to meet both of them on my immediate right. Lovely Ruth Hyde, Executive Director of uh, Community Engagement and many other things. Wears a lot of hats over at Crumley Roberts, Attorneys at Law. And next to her, a first time visitor of the show, Gaddis Long is Veterans Case Manager for Caring Services. We'll find out what that is in a minute. But also, he's an alumnus of the uh, Crumley Roberts Leadership uh, class. So we'll find out about that too. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Great to be here. Gaddis, I'm going to start out with you. Before we get going with the conversation, just give me a quickie on uh, what Caring Services uh, is. Caring Services is a substance use uh, treatment facility. Uh, we offer transitional housing and veteran-specific services. Okay. And this would be for alcohol or drug abuse people that need uh, some help and counseling? Yes. All right. Now, why, uh, Gaddis, why is uh, leadership development important in your role at Caring Services? Well, in my role, I, I work with homeless veterans. And in my role, we have to motivate, motivate by example. And um, leadership development, it, it humanizes. It lets me know I'm no, impo no more important than uh, the parts that make up the whole. Right, exactly. Now, what, uh, let me ask you kind of a personal question, Gaddis. What, what effect did the Crumley Roberts leadership uh, class have on you 
personally, well, also and professionally. So help me out on that. Well, um, it reminds me that I have to check my motives. I have to assess my priorities uh, and my values. Um, it encourages me to lead not just in the workplace, uh, but in life as well. So it really helped you. So you're sort of a cheerleader for this class, aren't you? I am. <laughs> the head cheerleader. Well, let's go. Well, I don't know if you can be the head cheerleader because right here, this, this lady here really, uh, Ruth, tell us a little bit about the upcoming leadership class this fall. Yes. Well, excited to be back in Greensboro because, you know, we've been rotating between um, the Triad Market and Charlotte. That's right. And uh, we actually have our meet and greet this evening in our first class on Friday. Uh, we will have 20 nonprofit leaders uh, representing a really incredibly diverse group of organizations uh, this fall. Super excited. Uh, we've been corresponding via email, seeing their nominations, why they're excited about this class, and uh, really looking forward to meeting them all tonight. Uh, now, remind us about, the, for people that don't know, remind us about the history of the leadership class and the impact that it's uh, had and still having on the community. Yes, well, Kim and Chris Roberts, and Kim specifically, believes that we should um, be a lifelong learner. And with that um, comes uh, professional development through uh, leadership. And we were really excited that not only could we host these classes and facilitate them for all of our employees, but also take them outside into the community and take this incredible curriculum that's facilitated by Hank Heidenreich um, to leaders who are running such important organizations like um, Gaddis and his work at Caring Services or other organizations that are doing uh, Health and Human Services uh, to City of Greensboro Parks and Rec, um, where we live and breathe and eat and, and, and pray. And you're already working with great leaders like Gaddis, but I think the, you, 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 they give you sort of an edge, aren't they, Gaddis, even on little things, well not little things, but like time management, you know, how am I doing this and maybe I can do this better, right? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, fostering healthy relationships uh, with others, and again, motivated by example. Absolutely. Now, uh, let's uh, let's have something up on screen here because I want folks to learn more about uh, not just the Leadership Center but uh, Crumley Roberts in general. And up on screen, www.crumleyroberts.com is the website. I'll say it again for the radio audience: crumleyroberts.com. And since uh, we have uh, Gaddis here as a special guest, let's put this information up on screen for caring services in case someone you know or love might need their help, and that is caringservices.org. And Gaddis, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 336 area code 886-5594 if somebody correct. wants to call or visit the website. I think what both of you do is great. Gaddis, I tip my hat to you and what goes on at Caring Services, and I'm glad you went through leadership class. Thank you. And uh, Ruth, thanks to you and Kim and Chris for all you do. Absolutely, thank you. We'll be right back after this. Back now on uh, Try Today, time for our uh, round table to gather. Well, they're actually already gathered. I'm just going to introduce them to you. On my right, but always the political left, the award-winning journalist broadcaster, Ogie Overman. Next to him, Dr. Don Martin, High Point University professor and vice chair of the Forsyth County Commissioners. And next to him, bringing up the rear, and I mean that affectionately. Yeah, sure you is, do. Uh, sure you do. Keith Granberry, founder <laughs> of uh, Helping Hands Consultants. Who's been, Keith's been out there uh, beating the bushes, making sure nationwide, trying to get people registered to vote. All right, guys, a uh, few uh, touchy ones I want to start with here. A right-wing group in Florida has been generating racist robocalls about the Democratic nominee for governor, who happens to be an African-American, uh, mayor from Tampa, I believe. If caught, here's my question, if these uh, racist people are doing these racist robocalls are caught, should they be arrested for hate speech? Ogie. Okay. Well, he's mayor of Tallahassee, just for the record. But, Tallahassee. Uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, it just shows the level of the public discourse, the level we've sunk to. It's just, I don't think it is exactly hate speech, but it just shows you what a mess we're in. Dr. Martin. I, I, you have to have some violence, I think, to, to prove hate speech. And about the only thing you've got is slander, and that's very hard to prove when you're a political candidate. Jeez. Mm -hmm. I think the word you said, if caught, that's what you said, correct? Right. That means that if the caught, I think they should, I think... These speeches, that these things that they're doing can incite violence and they can get people hurt. And this is what happens in many of these campaigns. It so they should Don, be arrested. It goes Absolutely. to Don's point, it causes indirect violence. Absolutely. So becomes, all right, speaking of hate speech, an African-American candidate for the Minnesota State House refers to himself as the N-word in a Facebook ad that he did himself. Guys, is it okay for a black candidate to use the N-word in a campaign ad? Mr. Ogie. You know, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, only because 
in the post-Trump era, we're going to have to try to raise the level of the, the public discourse, restore some dignity to running for office. I mean, you mean so the white supremacists won't think, hey, that's cool, and I'm going to... Yeah, exactly. They'll use it against him. Don. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. I mean, I think he can. I just probably, I'm with, uh, I'm with Ogie. I don't think it's very wise. Keith. First of all, I don't think he should use a word that was used to degrade us for hundreds and hundreds of years to describe himself. And there are young people who are looking at that, and, and, and he's running for an office that should inspire people, not talk about some, a word that degraded us. That's absolutely uh, uncalled for and so, unnecessary. So you think he's taking us backwards instead of Absolutely. Uh, some North Carolina Republican lawmakers say they fear we're headed for a civil war if we continue to let mobs tear down statues. Overreaction, guys, or do they have a right to be concerned? Ogie. Well, I think you've been listening to a little bit too much Charlie Daniels. <laughs> the South going to do it again and again. You know, Ironically, a lot of my friends on the left say the same thing for obviously different reasons. Different reasons. That's why I'm asking, Don. I, I, I think it's probably an overreaction. Keith? It's totally overreaction, but I still would like to see some black civil rights or some Indian civil rights statues somewhere in the Confederacy. Yeah, I took your idea about that because you've been talking about it. I took your idea and put it in my column this week because I think that you're right. You know, you don't have any statues like, well, you can go on the Winston-Salem State University campus and you see Dr. Atkins or whatever, but, you know, right, right there next to Silent Sam, there should be, yes. you know, a person of color right. with him. Absolutely. All right, as President mm -hmm. Trump continues to refer to the news media as enemy of the people, a recent poll shows that 43% of Republicans think Trump should be able to shut down a TV network if he thinks they're behaving badly. Quickly, guys, should a president ever have the right to censor the media, Ogie. Jim, I still consider myself a member of the media, and I cannot tell you how disgusted I am. But it's more than disgust, it's actually dangerous. The, the most fundamental right we have is freedom of the press. That freedom of speech, freedom of the press, it's just destroying all our norms. It's pitiful. Don, I agree, no. Keith. I mean, what country are we in where, uh, <laughs> the, I'm just trying to understand, where a president or anyone can shut down a TV station for uh, opposite views. No. Yeah. And he's trying to get libel laws changed because he wants to go after the Woodward book too, mm -hmm. so it's something all the time. But that <laughs> book is factual. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 well it is. An increasing number of parents, an increasing number of parents of female high school athletes are angry because male athletes who identify as female are outperforming the biological girls in sports contests. Should boys who identify as girls be allowed to compete in high school girls sports? Ogie. Well, this is a toughie because you know I'm an equality guy, Jim, and I'm an LGBT advocate, but this is almost different because what if Bruce Jenner had decided to make the change when he was in his 20s? I mean, it's just a little, it's an unfair advantage. Physiologically, there's not much you can do about it. Former superintendent of schools, Dr. Don Martin. I, 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 well, in this state, it, they're going to be separate, but, but basically, I agree. I think that they need to be, but you know, I was, if you think about golf, you know, golf's got a woman's tee and the men's tee, right. and I can see more competitions becoming joint. And you, and it's like you get a, an average. You can take an average handicapping kind of issue. Try to, that yeah, yeah. Keith. I don't know a sport yet that women uh, are outperforming men in many of these, uh, like basketball, baseball, football, track. There. That has to be separate. Okay. You, you cannot do that. And Just quickly, meanwhile, not. U.S. Open officials, speaking of that, have come under fire after penalizing a female tennis player mm -hmm. for changing her short shirt on the court. Now, male tennis players take their shirts off all the time on the court. They never get penalized. Are tennis officials guilty of a double standard, guys, or were they right to treat a woman's chest different from a man's? Ogie. Did she have on anything underneath? She had a sports bra. I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you asking for Well, and if so, what's the big deal? What right. is really the big deal? Don. I think it's a double standard. Keith. I think she should be able to do that. I mean, we, we let men do it. Why not let women do it? And finally, researchers have discovered that medicine made from baby poop can make you healthier. Guys, quickly, would you ever take baby poop medicine? Ogie. If it were life and death, I probably would. But other, short of that, I don't think so. Right. Uh, depends what the baby poop's going to cure, Mike. Yeah. I kind of agree. If it's curing something that is, has an illness, but other than that, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't all... want to be pooped on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Keith has dealt with some people who have 
<laughs> who pooped at him. That's exactly right. Well, that's all the time we have. Oh, except for this. A couple engaged to be married were living in separate cities, so the woman had Jimmy John's deliver a surprise submarine sandwich to her boyfriend. The delivery boy texted the woman and said, hey, no one came to the door, so he looked in the window and saw her fiancé in a naked embrace with another girl. Jimmy John's delivery boy told the woman, I guess your fiancé already had a sub. <laughs> Did that make any sense to you, Augie? Yeah, uh, Augie, with a little the, bit too much yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of in a sports bra way, I guess. With it. All right, for all of us here, try it today. I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you next time.